Welcome to the Achievable FINRA podcast. I'm Tyler, the founder of Achievable, and we have affordable courses for the FINRA SIE, Series 6, Series 7, 63, 65, and 66 exams with industry best pass rates. Each Achievable course includes everything you need to pass the first time. A full textbook, videos on key topics, thousands of questions backed by our memory enhancing algorithm, and full length practice exams. You can try it out for free at achievable.me and if you like it, use the code podcast to get you 10% off at checkout. This podcast was made from a video by Achievable's FINRA course author, Brandon Rith. If you'd like to have the visual aid of a video, please go to Achievable's YouTube channel and search for the video by the same name. Options are already a pretty tricky topic. And then on top of that, we can see questions on the taxation of options. So let's go ahead and use the time that we have in this video to break down all the important things we need to know when it comes to taxation on options. In particular, in this video, we'll focus on the tax consequence when an option expires, when an option is traded, and when an option is exercised. And we will end the video by looking at a practice question together. Let's go ahead and dive in. Option transactions can be be tax reportable, can be taxable, can be tax deductible. So let's go ahead and focus on the three primary events that could occur when it comes to an option. The first of which is expiration. Good news if you encounter a question involving expiration and tax consequence, this is pretty simple. When an investor has an option strategy in their portfolio and that option expires, it will always result in either a capital gain or capital loss in the amount of the premium. If an investor buys or goes long an option and that option expires, the premium is reflected as a capital loss when they report their taxes. If an investor sells, goes short, or writes an option, those all mean the same thing, and then that option expires, the investor will then report a capital gain in the amount of the premium. And that's it with expiration. Don't make it more complicated than it actually is. The second bucket we'll focus on here is what happens if an option is traded? Just because someone buys or sells sells an option doesn't mean they have to wait until it expires or until it's exercised for something to happen. If you go long an option, you can sell that option through a closing sale to someone prior to it expiring. Or if you go short an option, you can do a closing purchase and get rid of that position in your account by going back to the market and essentially buying back the same contract. When it comes to the tax consequence, all we need to figure out is what is the net premium. If the investor has a net debit, meaning that they spent more money than they brought in with the two transactions, meaning the front end transaction, the opening transaction, and the closing transaction, if they have a net debit on their hands, they will report that as a capital loss. If the investor has a net credit on their hands, meaning that they brought in more money with the two option transactions than they spent, that is a capital gain. For example, let's assume an investor writes one Jan 50 call at a premium of four. When an investor writes an option, it means that they sold that option. So that's a $4 premium in their pocket. If the investor goes back to the market and performs a closing purchase, where they're basically buying back the same contract to get out of their obligation at a premium of one, well, they sold the option up front for four, and then bought it back later for a premium of one. That is a net credit of $3 per share. Assuming there's one contract involved, they would report this as a $300 capital gain. When an option expires or it is traded before it expires, either way, the investor is locking in either a capital gain or a capital loss in the overall amount of the premiums that they paid or they received. And that's all we need to know for those two initial buckets. The third and last bucket, which is when an option is exercised, is our most common complex bucket. When an option is exercised, that might be the end of the option itself, but there is a stock transaction that is unfolding. And that is the main thing we need to focus on when we talk tax consequences of an option being exercised. Depending on what the investor is doing during the exercise, they will either be establishing cost basis or sales proceeds. They establish cost basis if they're buying stock through the exercise, and they will be establishing sales proceeds if they are selling stock through the option exercise. Let's go through all four basic options to make sure we feel really comfortable on the tax consequences of each type of exercise. We will focus first on a long call, which involves the right to buy stock at the strike price. When a long call is exercised, investors buying stock 
so the investor will be establishing cost basis. For example, let's say an investor is long a 50 call at four. If they exercise that 50 call, they're establishing an initial cost basis of 50 on the stock, Right? They're buying the stock at 50. But one thing we always have to factor in is the premium as well. Not only did they buy the stock at 50, but they also bought the option premium for four. We have to put both of those together to finally determine that in this scenario, the investor is establishing a $54 per share cost basis on the stock when this long call is exercised. A little trick that could help you with this question is if you understand break-evens on options, the break-even of the option is going to be what you report as a tax consequence. The break-even of a long 50 call at four is 54, and guess what? If this long 50 call with a premium of four is exercised, the investor is establishing a cost basis of 54. Next, let's look at short calls. A short call is the obligation to sell stock at the strike price. So the key here is stock is going to be sold if the option is exercised, which means the investor would be establishing sales proceeds on that stock position. Let's Say that we have a short 50 call at four and the investor is assigned, also known as exercise, the tax consequence would be an initial sales proceeds amount of 50 bucks. That's what they're selling the stock for, but they'd also sold the option up front. So that brings their total sales proceeds to $54 per share. And if you use my trick again, the break even on a short 50 call at four is 54. And that happens to coincide with the tax consequence that we just figured out. Now, the last two options strategies we'll focus on will be puts. And puts are a little tricky. You'll see why here in a second. Let's focus on a long put. A long put gives the investor the right to sell stock at the strike price. Let's assume that we have a long 50 put at four. If the investor exercises the put, they are going to be selling stock at that $50 strike price. And that is our initial foundation for the tax consequence here. It'll be 50. Now, the tricky part here is that we would be establishing sales proceeds. Remember, it's always a focus on what the investor is doing with the stock when they're going through the exercise. The investor bought the option up front, which feels like it should be cost basis, but at the end of the day, we're focusing on what the investor does with the stock. And the investor is selling the stock, which establishes sales proceeds on that stock position. Now, we can't forget that we have a premium involved here. The investor sold the stock for 50, but to be able to sell the stock for 50, they had to buy the option and pay that premium. So when you have a put, you wanna subtract the premium from the initial starting point of the tax consequence. 50 minus four gives us sales proceeds of $46 per share. And sure enough, this is also going to line up with the break even of the option strategy. Break even of a long 50 put at four is going to be 46, which is also the amount of the sales proceeds established when the exercise occurs. Okay, last one, which is a short short put. A short put comes with the obligation to buy stock. So if the investor gets assigned, they're going to be forced to buy stock, which establishes cost basis. Let's assume we have a short 50 put at four. If an exercise occurs, they're going to be buying stock at 50 and that will establish an initial cost basis of 50. Again, this is a little tricky because we sold the option up front. We sold that 50 put, but we ended up buying stock through the exercise, and it's all about what we do with the stock. We are establishing an initial cost basis of 50. We sold the option up front, but then bought the stock on the back end, and those are two conflicting actions, a buy and a sell. So we will subtract the $4 premium from the $50 cost basis, which gives us a cost basis of $46 per share. And sure enough, 46 is also the break even of a short 50 put at four. This is obviously a great way to check your work and to make sure that you got the right answer. So to summarize everything that we just went over with the exercise of an option, we always wanna focus on what the exercise means for the stock. Are we buying the stock? If so, that is cost basis we're establishing. Are we selling the stock? If so, that is sales proceeds on the stock position. And then we also have to factor in that premium overall. Maybe one other way to make it super simple is that with calls, you always add the premium to the initial cost basis or sales proceeds. And with puts, you always subtract the premium from the initial cost basis or sales proceeds. Let's see if you really understand this concept. I'm gonna put a relatively difficult question from this area on the screen. 
There it is. Let's go ahead and read through it together real quick. An investor holds an 80 call that was originally transacted for a total premium of $600. The underlying stock's market price rises to $95. The call is exercised and the shares are liquidated in the market. Assuming no transaction fees or commissions are assessed, what will the investor report when filing their taxes on a per share basis? If you wanna take a minute and pause the video and see if you can answer the question, go ahead and do so now. And when you hit play, we will break it down together. Okay, let's go ahead and look at it. The question establishes that an investor holds an 80 call. Now, if you know your options terminology, a holder or someone that holds an option just means that they bought that option or they went long that option. So this investor here has a long 80 call. They tell us that they paid a total premium of $600 on a per share basis, that would be $6. So basically, we have a long 80 call at six that the investor established in their account. Then they tell us that the underlying stock's market price rises to 95 and the call is exercised. And we'll just pause at that point. That should totally make sense. Calls get exercised when the market price rises above the strike price, call up, and we are 15 points above the strike price here. Now, if we look at the answers, we can see every answer involves both cost basis and sales proceeds. And that's because they give us a full picture here, but let's just focus on the exercise for right now. We just need to ask ourselves, what happened through the exercise? Well, a long 80 call gives the investor the right to buy stock at 80. So when they exercise the option, they are buying stock at $80 per share. That matches up with cost basis. So their initial cost basis that they'll report is going to be $80 per share. Now we can't forget about the premium. We have a $6 per share premium that's involved here. The investor bought the stock for 80 and they also paid for that $6 premium. So this long call being exercised establishes an $86 per share cost basis. Now looking at the answers below, if we feel confident with that $86 cost basis, there's only one answer that includes that. And sure enough, spoiler alert, that is going to be our right answer here. Regardless, let's keep going through the question to make sure we understand the big picture. Not only did the investor exercise the call and buy the shares at 80, establishing a cost basis of 86 with that premium involved, but they also then liquidated the shares in the market. Now the liquidation, also known as the sale of those shares, that's separate from the option exercise. That happens after the option is exercised and that establishes its own form of a tax reportable event. An investor that simply goes to the market and sells their shares for 95, assuming there are no transaction fees or commissions involved, will just establish sales proceeds of $95 per share. And that should confirm that the answer that we think is the answer actually is the correct answer. One last thing we can do to confirm the right answer is the right answer is to make sure that the tax reporting matches with the overall scenario. Meaning that if I go long an 80 call at six and then the market price goes up to 95, a good question to ask ourselves is what is the gain or loss if that occurs? Well, long 80 call at six, market price rises to 95. If you put all that together, the investor can buy stock at 80, sell it at 95, that's a $15 gain, minus the $6 per share premium paid, that will end up with a $9 per share profit. And that certainly matches up with our answer. If we have cost basis of 86 and sales proceeds of 95, that is a $9 per share capital gain being reported to the IRS. Now that last part might be a little confusing given the fact that we talk so much about exercise establishing cost basis or sales proceeds, and that is still true. The exercise of this long call established a cost basis of 86. It's just that we took that extra step in this question and sold those shares that were purchased through the exercise, which overall reflects a $9 per share capital gain. That added step is what helps us put the big picture together, but still, the exercise of an option by itself will only establish cost basis or sales proceeds.